you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter number 4. We are in a series entitled Multiply Me. Multiply Me. That, that divine increase is available to you and to me upon the asking. We find this passage in the book of 1 Chronicles chapter number 4. Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9 is a list of over 500 names where so-and-so begot so-and-so who begot so-and-so who begot so-and-so who begot so-and-so. And this is the lineage from Adam that takes us all the way to the grandchildren of David. And right here in Chronicles chapter number 4, we find this man named Jabez. And those of you that have been in church at all, I'm sure you've possibly read the book and, and um, the prayer of Jabez or you've heard the teaching. And for the past um, several weeks now, we have been on this journey of asking God for divine increase to multiply me. What I love about this text, these two verses, is right here in the middle of this, the, the, the Lord uses Ezra to communicate that there's this man named Jabez who is more honorable than all of his other brothers. But there's this, there's this tension between his honor and his name. And we find it in verse number 9 of 1 Chronicles chapter four, number 4 that says, Now Jabez was more honorable than all of his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, I bore him in pain. I bore him in pain. I, his mother named him Pain. All of his life, hey, what's your name? My name is Pain. When, when he would be outside playing with the rest of the kids in the neighborhood and it was time to come in for dinner, his mother would come and break the threshold of the door and say, hey, Pain, it's time for you to come back home. He would go into the school and on that very unnerving first day of class that we all have experienced where for me, my, my first name is Glendon. Some of you didn't know that. My first name is Glendon, but, but, I'm, but I want people to know me as Glenn. If you call me Glendon, I will not answer unless you are my mother. And I knew I was in big trouble when she used my entire first name. And then I knew I was getting beat when she used my first name and my middle name. But I wanted to be known by, by Glenn, and I remember the, 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 the nervous anxiety that was in my life every first day of class that I would go into a new school, and the teacher would look at the roll and say, Glendon! And then all the little, oh, Glenda, Glenda the Good Witch, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we represent the lollipop, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. If you do it today, I'm going to punch you in the neck. I'm just being serious. <laughs> and, and I remember the anxiety. Can you imagine being named Pain? In the first day of school, this teacher doesn't even know you. Your classmates do not even know you. And the first thing they hear is, is Pain here. Yes, Pain is now in your class. Can you imagine the anxiety of Jabez as he is, he's going and he's, he's, he's attracted to this young lady in his life and, and she's like, hey, what's your name? My name is Payne. Don't you want me in your life? All of his life, the anxiety of being labeled Payne because of one moment that was not his fault, one moment that was not his responsibility created such a label on him that his entire life was defined by a moment of pain for his mother not even himself. Yet he was more honorable, yet he was pain. But he was more honorable, yet he was sorrow. And this is the tension that Jabez lived with all of his life until at some point in his life, he got tired and knew that I have to call upon God, verse number 10. And Jabez called upon God and his cry was, multiply me. There, there has to be more to me than the pain I caused my mother. Multiply me. There has to be more in my life for my life. Otherwise, why would God even give me life? He called upon the only one who could do anything about it, and he said, oh God, multiply me that you would bless me indeed that you would enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil, that I might not live down to the name 
in which I have been called, that I may not cause pain. The first thing he said was, bless me. Well, pastor, that sounds very selfish. No. Because you measure the amount of blessing God has on your life by how you bless others. He told Abraham, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to the nations. And Jabez said, bless me. Secondly, he said, I want you to enlarge my capacity to receive more of you in my life. Number three, he said, that your hand would be with me. Where we're at this morning is that God's hand would be with you. Now this is an incredible, audacious ask. And I was raised in the worship era of the church where we transitioned from the hymns and, and, and the, the, the courses and, 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 and I, was, I was raised in the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. There is a difference. Just ask the Cleveland, Tennessee Church of God people. We have our own song. The Church of God is right. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I mean, we know we were right. I don't know what any of the rest of you are going to do. If you didn't come from the Church of God, hallelujah to the Lamb. And I love my denomination. I love where I came from. Hallelujah. But, 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 but I, remember, I remember the transition into the worship era. And we had this statement like, we just want to seek the face of God. We're going after the face of God. We're, we're going to seek the face of God. Come on, don't ask him for anything. Just, just go after the face of God. And, and, and I just remember in the Old Testament when Moses asked the same question, he said, nobody can see my face and live. Now, we live in the New Testament where the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But, but the, the cry of the praise and worship movement was, let us see your face. Jabez was not asking for the face of God. He was asking for the hand of God. And I realized something as I've been studying this over the past several months. That there are some things that come by way of his hand that can never come by his face. For you see, we easily, Jabez could have prayed according to Aaron in Numbers chapter 6. Oh, that you would bless me. This is how I want my people blessed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his countenance or lift up his face towards you and bring you peace. Jabez was not asking for peace. He was asking for increase. He said, I need your hand. Hand. Hmm. This hand, everybody just take your hand and look at it for a second. Your hand. I want the hand of God. The hand, it's, it's an interesting part of our body. It's the lower end of the arm used to grab objects. The hand. Could you imagine... Living life without being able to grip with your hand. His hand. 27 bones. Interesting. That the manifestation of my ability to grab hold of an object is by way of 27 bones. Interesting. 27 books in the New Testament where the Word became flesh that he could grab hold of the men and women of God that he had longed for throughout the Old Testament. It has a wrist. It has a palm. Interesting that that's where Jesus was pierced for your and my salvation. These 27 bones have 12 joints. Interesting that this Jesus of the New Testament that came to grip us, he had 12 disciples that ultimately came to change the entire world. 46 muscles. Interesting that there was 46 years that it took to build the temple that Solomon worshipped in that you and I have know as the grassroots of the beginning of the church at large, all by way of the hand. Four fingers, one thumb. Interesting that Jesus gave us a gift. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers the gift that he gave to the entire church. There's something about the hand of God. 
Not only are those structural things, but in addition to it, there are over 1,400 verses about the hands in the Bible. Over 1,400. Let me give you a few. You ready? There's a striking hand. There's a powerful hand. There's a strong hand. There's a good hand. The Bible speaks of a stretched hand. The Bible talks about a cunning hand, a folded hand, a blessed hand, an evil hand, a sick or slick hand, a withheld hand, a feeble hand, a wounded hand, a holy hand, a clean hand, a dirty hand, an earnest hand, a heavy hand, an anointed hand, a bloody hand, a lifted hand, a chained hand, an escaped hand, a marked hand, a loving hand, and a clapping hand. Over 1,400 declarations about the hand in the Bible. Jabez said, I want your hand with me. Interesting to me that the three ways you can identify an individual is their blood, their teeth, and their fingerprint. You can identify someone by the thing that is in their mouth. And from his mouth flowed a sharp two-edged sword that divided the nations. That you can identify the owner, of, the, 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 the owner of who he is by the blood. For you and I are an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But the other way you can identify someone is in their hand. I know it's you when I can recognize your hand. Isn't it interesting? Casey and her brother are identical twins. They're twins. They're twins. Yet they are distinctive in their fingerprint for no one in the history of the world matches their same fingerprint. You can look identical with each other, but your fingerprint, what's in your hand, makes you distinctive. Jabez was saying, I need action. That you would bless me indeed. That you would enlarge my territory and that your hand would be with me. The instrument of instruments, doctors say, is the hand. It is the instrument of of instruments. Imagine all of the things in the world today that you and I have the luxury of being with and living with, but it never would have happened if someone had not have used their hands to build it. This became abundantly clear to me over the last six months as we've been renovating this facility in our first phase of what God is doing at Judah Church in four and a half, five years. Everything you see in this room today is because someone brought it in by hand. And Jabez is crying, I, I need your hand with me. I, 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 need, I need your hand with me. I want you to understand something this morning. God has a hand. And the reason why this God, who is not limited to the confines of our humanity, gave himself a hand is because he wants you to know he's not just a God to be worshipped, he's also a God that can be brought to action. And I'm afraid so many of us, the only conversation, the only relationship we have with God is when we are talking about Him, but we never invite Him to act in our behalf, to bring His hand into our lives. What would happen in your situation if the hand of God came into it? What would happen? Listen, this is a powerful principle because we see it all the way back in creation. 
When God spoke all of these things into existence, he spoke the birds, he spoke the the air, he spoke the plants, he spoke the the, the seas divided from the land, and he spoke the sun and the moon and the stars, he spoke the festivals uh, festivals of days, he spoke all of these things into existence. But when it came to you and when it came to me, the Bible says that he got his hands in the dirt that he spoke into existence and he formed you and me with his hands into his image and his likeness. His hand. This God who holds the entire world, universe, in the palm of his hand. This God who holds our salvation in the piercing of that very same hand. Jabez is saying that your hand would be with me. Now this hand is a symbol of sovereign power. it's, It's a symbol of his action on the behalf of his people, specifically in regards to his redemption. And it is also used as a symbol of authority and oaths. Today, I just want to give you a few biblical principles of what it means to invite the hand of God into your life. To invite God to act. Most of us are convinced that we can fulfill His plan for our lives without His activity. But I submit to you today, if you can fulfill God's purpose for your life in your ability, it's not God's purpose. I submit to you today, That if God's purpose does not incredibly freak you out, it's not God's purpose. For how can the awesome power of God be available to us, yet we don't need it to fulfill His plan for our lives? Point number one. God's hand must be acknowledged. I want you to understand something today. While we're seeking his face in our worship, his hand must be acknowledged. Listen to these words in Psalm 28, 5. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord, watch this, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. Could it be that the reason you're always feeling less than is because you haven't acknowledged his hands active in your life? Not only must they be acknowledged, but number two, our responsibility is for us to submit ourselves underneath his hands. First Peter, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in the proper time. I must acknowledge it and then I must humble myself to it. I have this dog in my house. And, and we've named him Maximus. Maximus. Now he's a Pomeranian. If he was standing on the table, he'd be about this tall and he'd be smiling at you. Can't stand this dog. I hate him with an everlasting hate. I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, oh, they're so mean. I'm telling you. I call him Gluteus Maximus. That's, that's truth. That's truth. And, and Maximus knows who the leader of the pack is. I've kicked him through the house enough. I'm just teasing y'all calm down. But I have acknowledged and let him know from the very beginning that there's only one lead dog in this pack. And that is not mama. I wear the pants in my family. Now, she picks them out every morning. But bless God, I wear them. You understand? I mean, I I wear them. Belt and all. And and, and I'm I'm the leader of the pack. And he knows. And all I have to do is raise my voice. His ears drop, and he goes and finds a hole to hide in. Just in the event that I'm talking to him. (laughs) But it never fails on these occasions when I do go to Max and I actually want to be around him. He'll come, and it's usually when he's getting ready to go outside to, you know, 
put something in the grass that I can step in <laughs> and further hate him. Just teasing. But I would come and I would stand beside him. I would stand over him. And he would look up. And his ears would drop. And I would put my hand down. And he has a decision to make. Am I going to run out of fear of rejection? Or am I going to humble myself to say, you know what? I'm not the leader of this pack. But the leader of this pack has come to me. And he is wanting to either pet me or hold me or grab me or put a leash on me or lead me to my dog food or fill my bowl up with water. But I am going to humble myself. And I, it's a little unnerving because I'm not real sure if I'm going to be in trouble or not. But, but I'm going to humble myself enough to stay here, to sit here and drop my ears and let him know I'm grateful that a touch is coming to my life. You see, most of us, we're so afraid of God's rejection because of how jacked up our lives are that we will not drop our ears enough to let ourselves be humbled and allow God to put his hand on our situation. We're so busy running around like chihuahuas who have all this energy in all the world. We want to run around and just be hyper and fix everything and do everything because we're the God of our own lives. But meanwhile, God said, if you're going to allow me to work in your life and you truly want my hand, you must humble yourself to sit there and let me bring my hand into your life. And whether it's painful or whether it's a blessing or whether I'm holding you or I'm petting you you got to sit there and trust me enough that I love you with an everlasting love and I can do more for you than you can ever dream of doing for yourself I must acknowledge his hand and then I must humble myself under it here's why here's why you need the hand of God here's why this is the point this is the principle because number one God's hand creates when God's hand comes into a situation he creates it Isaiah 66 verse 2 says this for all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord, but not of this one I look on him who is poor and of, of contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. But the reason why all of these things are in existence is because my hand has come in the situation and I can create something. And I just want you to remember today that the Lord put his hand to create you, to form you, and to fashion you into his image and into his likeness that he created you and me. You are not an oopsie in a back seat. You are not a displaced person that God formed you before you were formed in your mother's womb he was already shaping you with the power of his hand not only does his hand create but number two God's hand holds the world and if God's hand can hold the world don't you think he can hold your bank account listen to Psalm 145 16 you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing throw that up there for me you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing could it be the reason why you're living so dissatisfied is because you've not allowed yourself to climb up into the open hand of God for you yes. not only does it create but number three God's creatures are fed from his hand he feeds with his hand. Psalm 145, 16. You open a hand and you satisfy it. The, the next one, God's hand is mighty. First Chronicles 29, 12. His hand is mighty. He has a mighty hand. In your hand is power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Could it be the reason why you feel so fatigued the reason why you're so tired is because you're so busy being the God of your own life. Meanwhile, the open hand of God is there to be displayed. And when his hand comes into your situation, strength comes as well. Not only that, but God's hand guides. It guides Psalm 139, 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? For if I flee, I can't even flee from your presence. If I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. 
I can't get away from it. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, you're there. Watch this, verse 10. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. This is the hand of God. This is the hand of God. God's hand also redeems. We find it in Psalm 138, verse number 7. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. And though I walk in the middle, you will revive me. Your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And your right hand saves me. He saves us by the power of his hand. Not only that, but God's hand, it ensures success. It ensures success. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand, he says. Listen. When God's purpose and God's plan is made available to you, there is not an absence of fear. Most of us want everything to be perfect and then we'll follow God's path. But if he made everything perfect, you wouldn't need faith. So I submit to you that where faith is available, fear is present. You can't be faithful without having fear pulling at you. That it is in those moments where I'm either going to go left or I'm going to go right. I've got a decision to make. And I've got to operate according to the faith. I promise you, fear is present. But when I know that God's righteous right hand is with me and on me, He ensures success. That I'm not going, although I may have issues, although I may have setbacks, that there is no failure in my life. That even the trying of my faith is there to make me strong. That even if I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to live in fear because I know he's with me. His rod and his staff are comforting me. And so even in my setbacks, I know they're setups for God to do a significant work in and through my life. And when his hand is on me, he promised that he would uphold me with his righteous right hand. Not only that, but God's hand is invincible. This is important for you to understand today. God's hand is invincible. Do you know what that means? That means God's hand is invincible. In invincible. This is not even an SAT word. This is invincible. Without ability to be penetrated. Without ability to be held back. Without ability to be stopped. Without ability to be enabled. His hand is invincible. And when I invite his hand into my life, as long as I have his hand on me, there's no weapon that can be formed against me that can prosper. Because I am humbled underneath the invincible hand of God on my life. That's why I have no problem letting you know that it is not by my might and it is not by my power but it is because the Spirit of the Lord that is sitting on me that His hand has come upon me. I don't know why He allows certain people to do certain things except He has decided that He's going to place His sovereign hand on them. 
Listen to the words. Indeed, before the day was, I am he. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. It doesn't matter what I'm fighting. It doesn't matter the sickness. It doesn't matter the pain. It doesn't matter the suffering. That no man can pluck me out of the hand of God. And if God has decided to put his hand on me, then it doesn't matter what you think about it. I've got the hand of God on my life. I'm not going to give myself credit. I don't know why he does what he does with who he does it with. All I know is somewhere, some way, God decided to put his hand on me and because the hand of the Lord is on my life, favor has to follow. It's invincible. It's invincible. It's invincible. Not only is it invincible, but it also protects. The hand of God protects Isaiah 41 10. So do not fear, for I'm with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. Again, I'm going to uphold you by my righteous right hand. I'm going to cover you. When people try to snatch you, I got you. You're climbing out of the boat. And you want to walk on the water of the miraculous in your own life. I'm going to uphold you. When you pass through the waters, I'm with you. When you go through the fire, I'm there. Let them throw you in a fiery furnace. I'll be the fourth man in the fire. Let them want to stone you. That's okay. I got you. I will protect you. That there is nothing that can come to me that doesn't first pass through the fingers of God in my life. That's why I can say, if God is for me, who can be against me? He protects with his hand. Not only that, but he also inspires with his hand. With his hand. Jeremiah 1 9 then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and Jeremiah began to prophesy that when the hand of the Lord comes on my life spiritual gifts begin to make manifestation I have the power to stand up and speak up thus saith the Lord because of the hand of God that sits on our lives listen you don't have to go be a theologian. You don't have to go to Bible college and get a master's in divinity or a doctorate in church leadership. I, I've watched people. I watched my grandfather who didn't know come here from Sikkim. He didn't know nothing about nothing except one thing, that when he got on his knees and began to pray, that the presence of the Lord would come in and God would begin to give him revelation and insight. I, I don't, my grandmother was a, basically a stay-at-home mom and, and she watched kids all throughout her life while, while my grandfather was, was a truck driver. But when that woman would open up her mouth, there would be such wisdom, and still is, there's such wisdom and knowledge and understanding and revelation. And I, I you know, I got a degree and all this stuff, and, and I'm sitting down, and, and there's never been a time that I did not communicate with my grandmother, that my grandmother did not teach me something. Why? Because heaven and earth did not teach her these things. But it came by way of the mouth of God. And when the hand of God is on your life, he will use the foolishness of your preaching to confound the most wise people in the earth. God's hand also brings us to unity and obedience. 2 Chronicles 30, 12. Also, the hand of God was on Judah. Hallelujah. The hand of God was on Judah. Let me tell you, this is my prayer. I, I don't want to build a church around my charisma. And I promise you, he does not want to build his church founded on a man but when the hand of God is on a place I hear it all the time you know, we were talking just this last night we were, we, were, we were having some pillow talk time and I'm, I don't know how transparent I should be all our all, all of our ministry I've had people look, snarl their nose, like, what, what do you, 
What, what makes you think you can do this? What? You're going to have a school of ministry? I'm going to stay relevant to SMC. You have a school of ministry? People are coming from all over the country, up and down the East Coast, part of the West Coast. What, what, what makes you think? I don't know. And in myself, I can't. But somehow, some way, the hand of God is on Judah. It's the hand of God. Blows my mind when thousands of kids show up in Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and we encounter the presence of the glory of the Lord. Do you know how freaky it is every Sunday morning for me to walk in here and see rooms looking like this? The average church in America is 70. Look at this room in five years. Why? Because I'm that good? Are you kidding me? Have you listened to my sermons? Half of you checking Facebook right now. But the hand of God is on Judah. It's the hand of the Lord that is on Judah. And I'm just going to tell you right now, if he ever removes his hand, I'm out of here. I don't know what y'all going to do. Y'all figure it out. But I'm out of here because I can't afford to go to his house and him not be home. I can't afford to allow the people, the needs of this city to come into these doors and not have the hand of God to be able to perform it. Those people that need unity. Listen, we just went through one of the most hard, most difficult seasons of our lives last year with the, with the riots going on in the city. And you got all of these other ministries that are incredible, doing amazing things in this city. And then the, the news media calls Judah and asks this little redneck from North Carolina to get up on WBTV and have a conversation about bringing the spirit of unity. Why did that happen? Because I politic? No, you know me. I'm introverted. I don't even like people. I'm just kidding. I kind of like you. <laughs> But in a moment where the city is looking for healing and looking for peace, the only way it happened is because the hand of God is on Judah. The hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of, ho of heart to obey. This is what I'm after. Red, yellow, black, and white, polka dotted, candy striped. I don't care what color creed you come from. We bleed the same blood and we must surrender to the same blood. I don't care if you live in multi-million dollar mansions and I don't care if you came from the hood. I don't care if you rode up in here in a Bentley or you got May Pop tires. Y'all know what May Pop tires are? You drive them every day and they may pop at any time. And you had to catch a, a Uber. <laughs> you had to catch a Uber to get here. It doesn't matter to me. Because it doesn't matter to him. We're all God's sons and all God's daughters. And when the hand of God is there, unity is not an issue. And he gives them singleness of heart to obey the command that the king was giving, what God was giving to that king in that city in that season. Not only that, but the hand of God signifies his oath. I want you to hear this this morning. If you don't hear anything else I'm about to say, anything else I've said up until this point, listen to me. The hand of God signifies his oath. He doesn't swear by his face. He swears by his hand. He will turn his face towards you and bring you peace. But with his hand comes his oath. Listen to the words. You shall inherit equally with one another. For I have raised my hand in an oath to give it to your fathers. And this land shall fall to you as your inheritance. The promises of God that are over your life is because God threw up his hand and he said, I swear I'm going to bless you. I swear I'm going to heal you. I swear I'm going to deliver you. I swear I'm going to make a way where the things will be. I swear I'm going to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. I'm swearing... I swear that I'm going to do what I got to do to make sure you get who you're going to be because I have loved you with an everlasting love and I have come to make covenant with you and I swear I'm going to bless you in such a way that your eye has not seen and your ear has not heard and it's never even in it and I swear by my right hand that I'm going to do it. Let every other man be a liar, but I'm going to be true. I swear I'm going to do it. God's hand also brings the victory. 
brings the victory. L listen, listen. Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, this is David talking about um, Saul. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool. The Lord said, you stay in my right hand. And don't you get out of it until I make your enemies your footstool. See, it's not a matter of if you're victorious. It's a matter of when he brings the victory. I want you to understand something. Your family is in your life to keep you humble. Anyone that has a mama or an auntie knows this. Our job is to keep you humble. It's not my job to puff you up, build you up, make you feel special. You my little Hercules. <laughs> Family's in your life to keep you humble. Come in today. You remember, you, don't you forget, I'll beat your tail. I don't care if you're 28 years old, I'll still whip you. You're in my house. Keep you humble. Keep you humble. Your friends are there to encourage you. It is the job of a friend to encourage you. You can make it. God's hands on you. You can strengthen. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the role and the requirement of a friend. And I submit to you, if you've got friends that never speak encouragement over your life, they're not friends. Your family is to keep you humble. Your friends are to keep you encouraged. But your enemies are to promote you. That God brings Goliaths so that you can take them out so he can take you up. You understand? That he brings the victory. And until this adversity, this adversary, this enemy, this thing that is against you, until you can recline on it like an ottoman, it is not over yet. But when it is over, I promise you, as long as you stay in my righteous right hand, God says, I'm going to make this enemy a footstool for you to relax on. I am preaching better than any of you are shouting this morning. Not only that, but God's hand creates increase. Watch this. I love this. Acts 11. Never seen it this way before. The Lord's hand was with them, talking to the, about the disciples. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. When growth and increase is in your life, it's because God's hand is on it. Where you see God's hand present, you see increase happening. Now, let me make sure you understand. Sometimes he has to prune so that more growth can come. But even in the pruning, it is for process of prosperity. Lastly, God's hand signifies joy. You will show me the path of life. Love this, one of my life verses. For in your presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. In his presence presence. Watch this. The reason why I'm inviting his hand into my life is because in order for his hand to be there, he must be there. And in his presence is fullness of joy. Listen, have you ever met miserable Christians? Now, some of you can't talk because you sit beside them. Because I see your face. Looking like you got baptized in lemon juice. I don't even know what's going on. And somewhere along the way, we said that the more holy you are, the more miserable you should be. Be ye miserable as I am miserable, says the Lord. You, you know what I'm talking You ever met them? They come in and they just look like they've been smelling armpits. And I got that big old Bible. And then, well, bless God, I just want to flip you upside down so you smile. What's going on? Tickle, tickle, something, you know, do something. Hallelujah. You know, I'm going to kick you in the shin and give you a reason to look ill. 
I mean, it's perpetual state of smelling armpits. Oh, press the Lord, press the Lord, brother. Praise the Lord. People who that stress me out, they make me nervous. Praise the Lord, brother. Listen, praise, praise the Lord, brother. No. One of the signs that you carry the hand of God on your life is that there is joy in your life. And I submit to you, oh God, thank you, Holy Spirit, that a life without joy is a life that has not yielded or humbled itself under the hand of God. And the re oh God, the reason, okay, I hear some of you. You cannot be happy and still have joy. Happiness is an emotion that is contingent upon circumstances. But joy is a fruit of dwelling with the Spirit of God on the inside of your life. And so I can be in a season of great pain, but still have great joy because, whoo, thank you, Holy Ghost. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross, but he had joy on the inside because he knew there was something on the other side of it when he got through it. See, joy is expectation of greater things to come. Happiness is circumstantial and conditional. And when his hand is on me, there's joy. 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 Down in my heart. And the devil doesn't like it. He can sit on a tack. You understand what I'm saying? We come to the house of God and we all sit here. Praise the Lord. Praise the, praise the Lord. What's wrong with you? That was my friend. Get near my. Praise the Lord. Life's, listen, heartache and hardships out there. I'm in my father's house. I get to clamorously act like a kid. He's the one that is in control. He is the sovereign God of the universe. He is the one that holds all this power of his hand. And he promised that all of my plans will be full of success because he's holding me in the palm of his hand. Why should I fear? Why should I be worried? He's got it all. As long as I give it to him. I want you to see this in this multiply me prayer. David said, I mean, Jabez said that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. That your just like when we say Jabez, we're calling pain. When I'm saying his hand what I'm saying is that you would enlarge my territory and that your ability to create would be with me your ability to hold would be with me your might would be with me your guidance would be with me your protection would be with me success would be with me invincibility would be with me redemption would be with me your ability to feed would be with me. Inspiration would be with me. Unity would be with me. Obedience would be with me. Your solemn oath to me would be with me. Your victory would be with me. Your increase would be with me. And your joy would be with me when I say, God, let your hand be with me. Be with me. Here's what the Lord showed me Friday. God doesn't just have a hand. He has two. He... How many right-handed people do I have in the room? Right-handed people. Right-handed people. A right-handed guy raised his left hand. That's so funny. That's hilarious. I love that. You must be a little amphibious. I mean, ambidextrous. I'm just kidding. Right-handed people. Listen, right-handed people think from the left side. They think from the left side of their brain. What balances your ability to act is your thinking from your left side. How many left people? You're much fewer. By name, how many left-handed people do I have in the room? Lefties have rights too. Hallelujah. Lefties. All my lefties. Left-handed people think from the right side of their brain. They only get one portion of their mind to create a balance of power. 
But God is not limited to only think from one side for you. He's ambidextrous. As powerful as he is in his right hand is as powerful as he is in his left hand. And as long as I have his right hand on me, I know that his left hand is working for me. While his right hand is working in me, his left hand is working for me. And I'm so thankful. And I heard the Holy Spirit say on Friday that there are some power of having my hand on you. But there's an unseen hand that you have no idea that I'm working out on your behalf. Praise God, not just for the hand that is on you, but for the unseen hand that is working for you. Now, and he showed me Jacob, uh, Abraham and Isaac when they were going up to the burning bush and, and uh, they were going up to sacrifice Isaac and Isaac is laid upon the altar and God with his hand is leading Abraham and Isaac but while God was leading him to the sacrifice of Isaac before God he was taking that unseen hand and he was shooing a ram up for redemption, for salvation, for provision with that unseen hand and I just want to tell somebody today that as long as the hand of God is is on you he's got his other hand working for you and you got a reason to know that success is secure success is secure Woo. that your hand would be with me. Let me rewind the tape for a minute. How are you still here? There are some of you that are running from God, trying to pretend His hand hasn't been on your life. The devil is a lie. How are you still here? Why are you not in a casket? hand of God you're sitting in here today and the pain that you have endured most people would be in a funny farm they would be locked up in a straight jacket how in the world do you have any of the sense that you've got in your mind today why because the sovereign hand of God has been laid upon you Don't you get it twisted? For if you do not acknowledge his hand, he will allow destruction to come to your life. If you refuse to humble yourself under his hand, he can't exalt you. There are some of you that are in the pits of despair and you've been living in this generational curse for years and now you're watching children beginning to operate in the same curse you've had to deal in your life. If you will humble yourself under his hand, he will exalt you in proper time. The hand of God is on you. The hand of God is on you. Why are you doing the things you're doing? Go in the places you're going. The hand of God is on you. Come here, God said. Met this little girl at a youth camp in Michigan. And I saw the hand of God on this girl. She's cute and bubbly and all, <laughs> you know, all the time. It's on my last nerve. <laughs> Show them that beautiful smile, Casey. Met this little girl with this big smile. And over the course of three years, I've gotten to hear her story, her family story, from the perspective of a little girl who's having to go through it, or had to go through it. I just want to tell somebody, listen, it doesn't matter where you start. 
But it does matter how you finish. Saw the hand of God on this little girl. I went home after the second year, I believe, of camp. I said, told my wife, I said, baby, I, I met this little girl. Gosh, she's happy. The Holy Spirit said, provide for her an opportunity to get an education. I didn't know she was coming to SMC. I just heard Holy Spirit. Let her get an, get, provide an opportunity. And if you got to pay for it, pay for it. I'll pay for it, God said. And M, who hadn't been to Michigan, she's from Ohio. She doesn't cross the line. OH. Go blue. All the way back home. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. You trust in Harbaugh. I got it. And I said, I said, M, God said. She said, God said. I said, well, what are we going to do? It ain't like I'm rolling in money. What are we going to do? I don't know. This is what God said. We're going to be obedient. This is our God said. Little girl comes here. With those dimples. A big old smile. And she's a little girl. Little girl. Her favorite two words was, I can't. Favorite three words, I don't know. I can't and I don't know. Favorite five words, I don't know how to. See, God's hand doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I can't, I don't know, I don't know how to. I can't, I don't know, I don't know how to. I can't, I don't know, I don't know how to. But the hand of God was on her. The hand of God was on her. And I don't know if that came by way of mom or dad or grandparents. But the hand of God was on this girl. All of a sudden, she's opening up checking accounts. Ain't got no money. Still open up checking accounts. Buying cars. Buying a car. Getting insurance. Pastor Glenn, I feel like I'm supposed to be a missionary all around the world. Well, I can't. I don't know. And I don't know how to. Does not translate very well in a third world country. You stressing me out. This is SMC right here. See all that? That is not from Jewish <laughs> rabbi. That, that's SMC. I don't know how to. I can't. I don't know. But the hand of God was on her. Flew back in yesterday. Sat down with her. I said, what's next? Haiti. We're going to join a team. We're going to, we're going to go to Haiti. And start talking about uh, the continent of Africa and, and all of this stuff. And, and I'm like, go on, girl. I dare you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and I dare you to fulfill the Great Commission. I dare you. The hand of God. It's the hand of God. It's the hand of God. Once you get over, I can't, I don't know how to. And I don't know, once you get over that nonsense and realize you don't have to, all you have to do is stay in the sovereign hand of God. He begins to make things prosper in your life, and He will prosper you in all things. Because the hand of God. Today, today, I want you to call on the hand of God. Listen, His face represents his presence but his hand represents his action do you want God present or do you want him to act 
because there are some seasons and situations in our lives we don't just need him there we need him to move and today I want us to call on the hand of God thank you baby. the hand of God those of you that have the blessing of the Lord on your life it, it's not because you're that smart are that good are that anointed are that great of a leader are that strategic of a thinker are that much of a vision do you remember where you came from do, do, never mind where you came from do you remember how foolish you were silly and petty and emotional whining and complaining and in spite of all of that God's hand remained in your life and he acted and if he's brought you this far he's going to bring you the rest of the way he's going to bring you the rest of the way as long as you humble yourself underneath that hand who's bringing you father in this moment I pray that your spirit would begin to blow like wind in this house to penetrate the deep places of our lives. Father, draw us by your Holy Spirit. Past the silliness, past the pain, past the hard heartedness, past our egos, past our puffed upness, past our sophistication, and bring us to a place where we acknowledge your hand that is active in our life. I ask it in Jesus' name.